So David, I actually want to follow up on that because Michael and I had um, a, a conversation off air weeks ago about whether or not it makes sense for Bernie to stay in the race. And I made the case that it's important for him to stay in because our conditions have changed rapidly. And you're right, uh, these conditions certainly do underscore the urgency of implementing the types of policies that Bernie Sanders has been pushing for literally for decades. And so my question is, why did he make the decision um, to drop out of the race rather than stay in and maybe more forcefully make the case for the very policies that all of these tens of millions of Americans who just got laid off would benefit from tremendously? Well, I mean, I, I take him at his word. I mean, he, he essentially said that 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 the focus on the coronavirus response has to be his first priority as a United States senator. He also suggested that the uh, math of winning the nomination was um, nearly impossible. Um, you know, I, I look, I, I don't think there's any right or wrong answer here in the sense of it's, it's a matter of opinion, it's a matter of judgment uh, in terms of whether he should stay in or, 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 or should have should have you know dropped out. I, I think there are good arguments on either side. Um, I, I think the question now is what kind of leverage uh, does he have specifically and what kind of leverage does the progressive movement have generally uh, over uh, the nominee? And I think, look, I think I've said this to a couple of reporters. I'll say it here. Joe Biden has a big choice to make. Uh, Joe Biden can be the Joe Biden of many, many decades in which Joe Biden made his public brand all about juxtaposing himself uh, in opposition to, in contrast with uh, the uh, base of the Democratic Party. I mean, you can find it, you know, there's an old press release of Joe Biden on a Senate website bragging about being one of the most conservative senators uh, in the Senate. Uh, we've seen that model. Uh, that was a big model in in the in the past of the Democratic Party. I mean, Joe Lieberman was the most famous for it, in which politicians go into general elections, Democratic politicians saying, hey, I am not a progressive. I am not a liberal. I am not part of the uh, supposedly radical base of my party. Look at me. I'm a moderate. It is a triangulating model. That was the dominant model of national democratic politics for, you know, 30 plus years. The choice for Joe Biden is, is that his model? And I think at the last debate with Bernie Sanders, there were some disturbing signs that that still is or still may be his model that he was extremely combative over the issue of Medicare for all. He dug in. Uh, after the, um, the the debate, his chief advisor, uh, Anita Dunn, went out and uh, said, and I'm paraphrasing here, you know, what you saw was Joe Biden dispensed with the kind of protester that he's dispensed with his entire life. Uh, so, you know, a, a very um, scoffing and sneering attitude towards the base of the Democratic Party. So that's one choice that Joe Biden can make. And I think that is a destructive choice. I think that will not unify this party. It will not energize voters. Uh, it is the wrong way to go. But 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 don't underestimate the uh, power of that triangulating ideology and that triangulating theory of winning elections, even though it has often been an election loser. Uh, don't underestimate the power of that. Uh, so, so that's one choice he can make. The other choice he can make is to actually reach out to the progressive base of the party uh, and make real substantive policy concessions uh, to that base, not just rhetoric, but real concessions to that base to build a broader coalition. I mean, here is the thing, for as much criticism as Bernie Sanders received for not broadening or expanding his coalition in the Democratic primary in 2020, uh, which some of that is valid, I mean, that's in the numbers, Joe Biden, didn't exactly have an incredibly broad coalition either. Now, he managed to win the primary. So, so, so that's, you know, in his favor. But if you look at the um, exit polling and the demographics, Joe Biden's coalition is relatively narrow. And if he wants to expand that coalition to energize and truly unify the party, he is going to have to discard a way of thinking about politics that he himself has been a champion of for many, many decades. He and the people in his campaign, they are going to have to, if they want to unify this party, they're going to have to suck it up. They're going to have to not sneer at the base of the Democratic Party. They're going to have to not insult or denigrate the base of that party. They're going to have to offer more than just Trump is bad. 
that message, they're going to have to actually reach out and engage. And I'm not sure whether they're going to do that. That's the big question in my mind. That's the big question moving into the general election. So, David, you're talking about the base of the Democratic Party, and I, I'm, I'm curious about that. And because I think that obviously and, and it's very clear when we look at people like Joe Biden or Bill Clinton that, yes, they built their whole careers off of, of saying like, hey, I'm the Democrat who will cut Social Security or Medicare or demonize people of color or attack labor. And then we look at this 2020 primary and you would know the different you, you would have more insight just because of your role, like in terms of actually breaking down the different demographics here. But it's like, is it is it if we looked at like three demographics in the party and correct me if I'm wrong, but it's like there's the working class coalition that is predominantly younger that Bernie spoke to clearly and did mobilize very effectively, not enough to win, but mobilized significantly then there's this not a majority but a not insignificant part of the party that really is kind of like and and maybe part of the base they're voting in primaries they played a pretty big role in 2018 midterms they really are kind of more of like suburban don't like trump socially somewhat tolerant but not economically progressive and then is there this kind of Biden wave of, in some ways, like almost the parents, like I'll, I'll just be real explicit. My grandmother is a retired uh, union uh, uh, woman in, uh, in Florida, right? She literally worked at Penn Station and was able to retire well because it was a completely different time, you know, in terms of her labor power, basically. Uh, and, you know, she likes Bernie, but she felt more comfortable with Biden. A lot of it was electability stuff. And that it seems to me that, First of all, what exactly is the base if there's all these different sort of facets of it? The Democratic base might be more complicated than the Republican base. And secondly, do we have to really distinguish between some of the more kind of like professional class, educated types versus making a progressive message more comfortable and more palatable for basically older working class voters who maybe are more persuaded by media than younger voters, mainstream media. I mean, that that's, a, that's a very that's a very astute analysis. I mean, my response to it is one way to clarify things, and this is slightly oversimplifying things, but one way to clarifying clarify the divide in the Democratic Party is just purely generational, uh, that that you have uh, older voters who are more um, ideologically conservative, but but also more politically conservative. And by that, I mean, um, not necessarily as open or, or motivated by the prospect of far reaching systemic change. So there's ideological conservatism, which is, you know, essentially Republican policies, but there's also a, a, a greater hostility to just any kind of systemic change, a very status quo, um, uh, a status quo preference. And, and look, we're speaking in broad terms here. This is, you know, we're, we're sort of generalizing here. But but the point is, is that is that is that what we know in the Democratic Party is, is that when we look at voting preferences, Biden, I mean, Biden literally campaigned by saying nothing would fundamentally change. I mean, that is like how, how much more crystal clear can you get? With a status, with a, with a promise of the status quo, and I I actually believe that that was in some ways appealing to a sizable segment of older voters who are nervous about systemic change as they approach uh, retirement and 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 their senior years. I think that's a real dynamic that we have to to deal with. Now we're living in in a moment where the idea of preserving uh, the status quo or even going back to this mythical uh, uh, quote unquote normal uh, seems more and more mythical, more and more fantastical, more and more fraudulent. So, I mean, the, the argument that um, the progressive movement needs to be making is, one, there is no going back. And, and P.S., going back to the quote unquote normal, I mean, the, the, the past, quote, normal wasn't that great. I mean, let everyone so let's remember the financial crisis. I mean, that was not exactly our our shining moment here as as a nation. Right. So so 
so one, we can't go back. And two, if we don't go forward with very bold policies, then we face a catastrophe. And I think that it's it's hard to motivate voters um, with doomsday pro, uh, 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 doomsday projections, but we also have to be honest about it. I mean, the choice is not preserve a status quo and stay at some sort of uh, uh, tolerable stasis, or you know have a you know far-reaching uh, disruptive uh, revolution. The choice is actually between an a, an absolute set of cataclysms. A climate cataclysm, we're going through a pandemic cataclysm. That's one choice, you know, a a a feudal economy where right. you know, fewer and fewer people own more and more of the wealth, and basically people can't can't get the basic necessities. That's one choice, or systemic, um, some might say, quote, radical changes to our economy, so that we can have a new normal that actually creates some stability for everyone in this country. Those are the actual two choices. It's not a safe normal versus some sort of, you know, very disruptive revolution. It's it's a disruptive set of catastrophes of great human suffering versus systemic radical changes to create a new form of stability. That's the actual choice. And the progressive movement needs to be articulating it in those terms.